Welcome to Solo, the single person's guide to a remarkable life. Your host, a behavioral scientist and bachelor, talks to leading experts and successful singles about living solo and living well. Travel more, make things, sleep in when you want to. Here's the playbook for the person who is unapologetically unattached. Now, please welcome Dr. Peter McGraw. Welcome back. Thank you for the continued support. This conversation went long enough that I split it into two parts. I talked to a scientist who specializes in evolutionary psychology and a comic who has material about dating and mating from an evolutionary perspective. They present a primer on evolutionary psychology and we have a far ranging conversation covering topics from how the modern mind has not adapted to the invention of birth control to why children may be viewed as parasites to the puzzles that evolutionary psychology struggles to answer. We explored the tension between a solo lifestyle and our evolutionary motives and culture shaped by those ancestral desires. The conversation's a little messy, and so I want to highlight something important. Our evolutionary past suggests that humans as a group are guided by very real urges and preferences to procreate and find particular kinds of mates particularly appealing. Nevertheless, those explanations do a poor job of accounting for any one person's behavior and preferences. In other words, you may be an exception. Moreover, it's impossible to understand current behavior and preferences without noting the important role that culture plays in shaping desires and behavior. Said another way, although living a solo lifestyle and thriving was not the norm back in the day, Today it can be because 1. Procreation is not the only important thing in the modern age. 2. Technology now allows people to live a solo remarkable life. And 3. You can have important connections to others beyond lifetime partnerships, what scientists call pair bonding. I hope you enjoy the episode. Let's get started with part 1. Welcome to Solo, the single person's guide to a remarkable life. I'm Peter McGraw. Today's first guest is Marty Hazelton. Marty's a professor of psychology and communication and a member of the Institute for Society and Genetics at UCLA. Her research interests span a wide range of topics, from cognitive biases to mate selection and sex differences. Marty is the author of Hormonal, The Hidden Intelligence of Hormones, how they drive desires, shape relationships, influence our choices, and make us wiser. The book's been translated into eight languages. Welcome, Marty. Thank you. Happy to be here. It's great to have you here. My second guest is Shane Moss. Shane is a professional comedian who specializes in comedy about science. He hosts the science podcast, Here We Are, and is touring with two shows. One is Stand Up Science, which is half comedy and half science show, and the second is Head Talks, which is a special psychedelics version of that show. You can find him in the documentary film, Psychonautics. Shane is also a good friend and special contributor to my new book, Stick to Business. Welcome, Shane. Hello, hello. So, um, Marty. Um, yes. You've been studying evolutionary psychology yeah. your entire life. My, my, well, my whole, my whole entire academic adult career. Life. Academic <laughs> career. Not yeah. entire life. <laughs> Though your interests are obviously quite varied, this mm. is sort of the foundational yeah, approach right. you mm -hmm. take. So I want to hear how you got into that, but yeah. I, I want to tell a quick story. We've met rather recently, though you have, I've assigned one of your papers in oh. my PhD seminar for many years. Okay. So for the listener who doesn't know this, there's a variety of ways that academics get evaluated. So they get evaluated by the the quantity of their papers, sometimes being judged by the the quality of the publications, other things like uh, the number of citations that your papers get. So, do other other academic authors cite that work? Use it in their in their own papers. One of the ways that that you get evaluated, at least in my department, is are your papers being assigned in PhD seminars? So, do they serve as some foundational knowledge for the field? Now, so in ca in the case of of your work, Marty. I, I've taught a behavioral economics PhD course for many years, mm -hmm. and I do a session on non-traditional approaches to decision making. Uh huh. And I have applied 
to not applied, but I've I've assigned your error management theory paper Great. Awesome. from back in the day. So Brett is it, it's getting up there. It's twenty years old. Twenty years old. It's got a ton of sites too. It's it's had some time to accrue them. Yeah. <laughs> um, before we get into your so, so your own personal and professional story, I'm a big fan of this idea. Mm. And can you talk a little bit about about what it is and and how you how you came to it? Yeah. And, and Shane, I want you to jump in because I know because you and I have talked about this. Yeah. Offline. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I had gone to work with my PhD mentor, David Buss, who studied mating and sexuality and was very well known for that work. Uh, is it the University of Texas? This was, actually, he was at the University of Michigan at the time. That's why I started my PhD. And then he left for Texas and I went along with him. I see. I was, I, I needed to, my feet to not be blue anymore. Mm-hmm. It was a little cold for me in Ann Arbor. And David wrote the first textbook on evolution. He did. He did. It's a relatively new field in right. the sciences. Yep. Definitely. I mean, that happened. Uh, I think the textbook came out maybe soon, right around the time I was getting my PhD. But before that, he was well known for shaking it up in the mating arena okay. and making claims about. Figuratively. Yes. Uh, well, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's a, um, so, and he was making claims about sex differences and, evo- you know, and how they might have evolved and how they might be universal. So, do women more than men prefer. A, a mate's earning capacity and mm-hmm. do men more than women prefer a mate's physical attractiveness and so and those were some hypotheses that followed from some reasonable evolutionary logic but they came but it was super controversial and um, got him into a ton of hot water so it was it was definitely something that everybody was talking about and this was happening um, that paper and its aftermath you know happened for a, a number of years but I was I walked into graduate school kind of in the middle of it all and I thought, well, I just don't want anybody to think that I am doing derivative work because he was so famous for that mm. stuff. So I walked into his office one day and I said, you know, I don't want to do anything that has to do with mating. And I tell this to my current PhD students and they think that this is very funny because, of course, that is what I do. Um, in the course of having that conversation with him, we decided that I would do something that was different, like... What is this thing that people can do where they can model the mental states of others, um, which is a, a, um, a capacity that is, if not limited to humans, limited to humans and a couple of other species, the ability to understand that another individual has a mental state that is potentially different from your own. I see. Um, and so we got to talking about that and we started to think about how about applications of that and he brought to my attention the existence of a bias, which was um, it, a bias in representing a person's mental states. And it was that men have a tendency to overestimate women's sexual interest. And he said, your assignment is to go home and learn everything you can about that and come back with an explanation. Because if you can come up with an explanation for that, then I think that we might have some mileage in other areas. Mm. I and see. that was just that was and that is exactly what I did. And error management theory came from that. Um, and error management theory is not a theory about about biases only limited in our mating limited to our mating psychology but it is quite broad and it's been applied across many domains in social psychology um but what i did was i i went home and i thought it through and i thought well why in the world would men overestimate i said you know why would they have this optimistic bias and eventually after quite a bit of thinking the idea was that well it's sort of like your smoke detector um it can be wrong in in one of two ways. Mm-hmm. It can overestimate or detect fires when they're not really present or can underestimate and fail to detect fires that truly are present. And which of those directions do you want it to be erring toward? Um, so engineers, when they're designing these things, they can t- adjust the settings and they can set it so that your smoke detector goes off when you burn toast, mm-hmm. um, which is probably what you want. Or, you want it to err on the safe or side. Or mold wine in my basement. Uh, <laughs> will you never let that go? <laughs> that was in your kitchen. Me, mm-hmm. uh, Somebody and, forgot about the mold uh, wine. No, no. Me and my, uh, me and my ex were uh, staying with Peter and we got in late. And so, uh, like, we let ourselves in or whatever, and we're being really quiet. My ex at the time wanted to make mulled wine <laughs> and just, like, put it all together on the stove. 
and then it set off the smoke alarms at like, at like one two, in the morning yeah, or something one, two in like, the morning. like that, <laughs> which especially for Peter who goes to bed at like nine, um, <laughs> more like 10, but yes. Well, that's a, that is a festive example. That is a, that's a festive, yeah. a festive example of this. And so, but you, so you can apply this concept of erring on the safe side to a variety of different domains. And for men throughout our evolutionary past, erring on the safe side might have been thinking that she's interested so that you don't miss a real sexual opportunity. Because every new mating opportunity is potentially a new offspring that could be produced. And so men who tended to err on the side of assuming sexual interest where it's not present, overestimating a woman's sexual interest, they were more likely to leave progeny than the guys who underestimated progeny? and missed, yeah, offspring, babies, ah, okay. babies, the currency of the currency of natural selection. I see. You know, and the same thing doesn't apply to women because not every new sex partner is going to be a new baby made. Mm-hmm. And you got to think about this in the ancestral past when we weren't using reliable contraception. So every every sexual event um, was meaningful, was potentially very meaningful, very yes. consequential. Um, but the consequences for the two sexes are different. Um, and for a man, taking opportunities for casual sex when they are present are pretty. That's a pretty low cost proposition all else equal, or at least in comparison to women, where um, a a poorly considered sexual choice could potentially result in an offspring that she has to care for for a very long time. Um, So women, for women, um, assessing a partner's potential interest, um, that our thinking was, and this was the new hypothesis, so we already knew that men, or at least the evidence was that men overestimate women's sexual interest. So they're erring on the side of optimism. We thought that maybe women would be a little pessimistic about men's interest, but in particular about men's interest in forming a long-term relationship. I see. So instead of short-term, thinking about it long-term. Thinking about long-term and, and sort of trying to assess a, a man's interest in forming a long-term relationship, interest in commitment. We called it the commitment skepticism hypothesis. I see. And so in the course of developing that Error management, so the idea is you manage the costs of errors. So do you overestimate Mm -hmm. or underestimate? You manage the cost of errors on the on the plus side if you're a man assessing a woman's sexual interest and you are on the other side if you are a woman assessing a man's commitment interest. And so the bias, the direction of the bias, we can potentially model, predict, hypothesize from knowing something about the ancestral past and the kinds of problems that our ancestors faced. So that's 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 where error management theory came from. Okay, so I want to step back because I think some listeners are familiar with these ideas mm-hmm. because they have made their way into right um, outside of academia, and they're a lot less controversial than they used to be, mm-hmm. and so on. And so, so let's let's talk about this sort of asymmetry that exists yeah. there. So, and and correct me anytime I say something wrong here. So, if I understand you correctly, the the sort of basis for the work that was being done in your laboratory Mm -hmm. at that time was that we have this ancestral past where the currency was have good, healthy babies. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and the reason for that is to, to pass your genes along. Yeah. Or your genes simply were not passed along. If you failed to do that, you became an evolutionary dead end. That's right. Like I'm going to be. (laughs) And so (laughs) me too, buddy. (laughs) Yeah. Oh, not with a bang. <laughs> or a, uh, uh, I like that reframing. That's a good one. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's yeah. like, and I mean, it's not going to get any better than this. Mm-hmm. So let's just end uh, it now. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So we did um, it. <laughs> um, I am uh, okay. So all right. So that so because that is paramount, and this is not something that is conscious yeah, per se. Right. This is something that is sort of instinctive. Is that a fair word? To um, use? Yeah. Right. Right. But it's not even that there's an instinct to pass on your genes. Rather, there's an instinct to do the things that in the ancestral past would have passed on our genes. Like sex feels good to motivate. Yes. Having yeah. sex. So that, uh, right. and, and so then most people are consciously detached from it because they're like, oh, I'm having sex so that I feel good. Yes. You know, they're detached from the process of. Okay. And, and but because the cost of having a baby. Mm hmm. Are, and passing your genes along are asymmetric, right. where, where between the sexes, a woman's mm-hmm. is is has has to give a lot more, mm-hmm. both in terms of the pregnancy yeah. and then beyond the right. caregiving, mm-hmm. and the man, twelve seconds, maybe you know, or maybe a lot, or maybe more. a lot more, a lot more, yes, yeah. or maybe a lot more. But there's certainly an asymmetry <laughs> mm-hmm. in, in terms the minimal. Of yeah, the uh, minimum investment is is vastly different for the sexes. Yes, although they could become 
maybe not equivalent, but closer in, yeah. a, in a sense, mm-hmm. especially if you can think about it in a modern modern age or something sure, like that. Sure, yeah, when people engage in, yeah, when people get together with a partner and cooperate to rear offspring, That's they, right. they might be 50-50 in their yeah. investments. Or, you know, a stay-at-home dad, right, is now mm-hmm. right doing more more of that kind of work. Okay. Maybe. And, I'm, maybe. I'm thinking of all of the stuff that my ancestors, women and men, did and, like, worked so hard, got through plagues, fought wars, survived, farmed. All the like get to me, and I'm like, eh, I don't really feel like yeah, it. Yeah, no thanks. <laughs> right? Oh man, that sucks. It's a good thing they don't know. I don't want to screw up my remarkable life. <laughs> so I, <laughs> um, well, we're gonna get back to that because we're gonna talk about birth control because mm. I think I, that's an important. I also, so, I, I don't want to step on anything here, but when you something caught my attention when you said reliable our ancestors reliable contraception oh, so yeah. so was there actually like uh, contraceptive measures before good, kind of the right, modern that's, yeah that's a good you know, i mean before the rhythm method uh, or the yeah i mean or I just, people have been before, pulling out for a while people have probably been masturbating for a long time those are two like somewhat, chimps don't pull out uh, <laughs> chimps, <laughs> chimps don't pull they out haven't got, they haven't gotten the memo <laughs> uh, that's funny i don't think they do but yeah i mean that's <laughs> but they masturbate huh so pulling out is just a little higher on the intellect uh, <laughs> wait hold on let's not let a bunch of dudes who are that- pulling out <laughs> think they're smart okay. <laughs> that's true but they were like i mean all I, i've seen things of our past um you know century older yeah. or even a thousand two thousand years yeah. ago of them using like some contraceptive yeah makeshift diaphragm kind of contraptions mm-hmm. so people have been that's what's complicated I, to me that people have been recognizing mm-hmm. the enormous costs of these offspring yeah for a very long time it's kind of surprising that evolution would almost allow for a psychology that would even become self-aware that's, of that's that. an int- that's interesting i mean you know <laughs> gosh just to connect the dots across this and another area of my work which is the, the looking at women's hormone cycles women's hormone cycles and and the day of ovulation within women's hormone cycles so that's the day of ovulation is and the few days before that that's the fertile period of the cycle but that is a that is a moving target from one cycle to the next okay and um it would be interesting if that is more true in humans than in other species. Oh, to, because it's moving. In- it, 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 it prevents us from tracking cycles mm, quite as easily. That's interesting. So it's basically your body's tricking Sneaky. the mind that knows, has some Maybe, signal. Maybe. I don't know. Okay. I do Total like the idea that there's like bits of deception built into our psychology. Right. Like well, Robert Trivers that you've yeah, written you would, stuff you would with. Expect those- as, soon as, as soon as we did become aware and started to try and prevent pregnancy that there would potentially be some new gizmo in the head that that works around that yeah. you know de- deceives us in some way perhaps all right i'm gonna pull you two back in because mm-hmm. you guys are starting to get a little bit into inside a little baseball. too interesting <laughs> okay peter no i'm just trying to, I'm trying to build i'm trying to build up to, the, to <laughs> I these know, ideas. i know i know so okay so i think we can establish mm-hmm. that and then as a result of this asymmetry in cost mm-hmm. The argument was there's a variety of behaviors and cognitions that are that yeah. follow from that. Right. Mm-hmm. Okay. And so let's step back. One of those, or preferences, let's call yeah. them. So one of those things, and I remember learning about this stuff around the same time because yeah. I was a I started my grad program in '97, mm-hmm. so a lot of stuff was was really mm-hmm. popping then. Mm-hmm. Was an asymmetry in what males are interested in in their partners versus females. Mm-hmm. So males in terms of health, youth, youth beauty, mm-hmm. and females in terms of broadly speaking status or uh, what's the right word? Um, Ability to provide. Yeah, yeah. status, resources. Or resources, thank yeah. you, Res- resources. And so this theory is designed to explain that To preference. explain those things, but those, so those preferences really apply mostly to thinking about long-term mate choice for both sexes. Okay. As soon as you start asking about side relationships or more short-term one-off kinds of relationships, 
then those sex differences, they, they just change in character. So women do care a lot about physical attractiveness, especially if that's if especially if it is going to be a short term encounter. This is, you're, now you're supposed to jump in with a joke here. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 yeah, I mean, that's a, the, the preference. It, it's funny because the the I mean, it's almost kind of the opposite for males then where there's like a lowering of standards if right. it's not going mm-hmm. to lead to yep. future costs of yes. having to stick right. around and provide and everything else so yeah. the flexibility around preferences yeah based so upon it, goals. It just, it's contingent it's mm-hmm. contingent on on what sort of a mate this is and so if a woman is going to have a one-time sexual encounter with a man he better offer something really good for her off for her potential offspring and if he's very attractive, then that suggests that he might have um, really solid underlying genes. Yes. So there's there's um, it, taking birds, which some bird species seem to um, uh, kind of have similar kind of mating strategies as humans, where they have a lot of pair bonding and and then there's like a bit of fooling right. around mm-hmm. here and there. Yeah. And pair bonding and, is like coupling up. Yeah, okay. yeah, coupling up coupling and up, socially, up socially like monogamous, but like a little fooling around on the sides. And typically it's kind of like what you'd expect the tens pair off of the tens, nines pair off of the nines, eights, I uh, see. seven, six. And you get down, I don't know what a bird three looks like if they have like a wonky <laughs> wing or something like that, but whatever it is. But then, but then the logic is if like a, say a female five that's partnered up with a male five, if she's out and about and there happens to be a male ten around, she can go and grab some jeans from him quick, and then have the five no skin raise off them. his back and yes. have the five raise. I see. It's, yeah, it's not okay. unheard of. Okay, so then error management theory fits into this a little mm, bit because mm-hmm. of the asymmetry. Right. Mm-hmm. So so an experiment with this goes something like this, if I remember this yeah. correctly, mm-hmm. is um, uh, you, you have male and female experimental participants interact, mm-hmm. and, um, and then you afterwards you ask them, like, how interested was that other yeah. person? Mm-hmm. And the men were like, oh, yeah, she's really into me. <laughs> and, and then if i remember correctly it's both both the guy that was in that and, and the guy watching it and if you have observers of this mm-hmm. male and female yeah. observers and then you ask them this and then and you, the male observer is like oh yeah she's totally into him right and then if you ask her how into that guy are you she's like eh, just being nice i'm just being nice I'm yeah. just, it's an experiment right, mm-hmm. right? It's, right. it's a pleasant interaction yes and the idea is that if he doesn't ask her out if he doesn't pursue this then he might be missing a valuable mate opportunity that's right yeah and so you know he's erring on the side of assuming that she is and you know if he gets a slap in the face that's a relatively low cost yes okay Mm -hmm. that's great and i i I like i offered that paper because i my students are learning a different way of thinking about human Mm -hmm. thinking which is built off of a basis of maximizing utility yep. and a sort of mm-hmm. microeconomic mm-hmm. approach mm-hmm. and then us sprinkling in some social biases, some emotions, mm-hmm. some limited cognitive resources yeah. to show predictable deviations. Right. And I just don't think, you know, that yeah. that all of those things can explain the kind of deviations that that you were showing. Yes, I think so. And I, you know, I mean, I, that was the contribution that I was really hoping that we might be able to make because the, the the standard model as I saw it at the time was that the deviations were due to limitations of the mind. And, mm-hmm. you know, instead what we were thinking is that, no, they're not irrational or they're not um, exposing our cognitive limitations, but they're better than rational. Um, so, you know, by by adding in these biases, we're actually making the system better than than having the system like cut, you know, cut it down the middle and, and have a, an equal number of false positive and false neg- negative errors, which would look more like what a rational choice model, the, the kind of default model that you were talking about, what that kind of model would predict. Yes. So it's irrational within like an individual or a choice, but very rational over the scope of evolutionary time. It, a lot of... Uh, yeah. I mean, it's more error prone, um, but those are, you know, sort of like errors by design. It, yeah. It recognizes there are two different... So in, in science, there's what we call type one error. Mm-hmm. And yeah. that is you say that there's an effect, but there is no effect, right? So you say that this exists in the world, then it doesn't. 
And then the other one is type two error, where you say this doesn't affect this. This effect doesn't exist in the world when it does. Mm -hmm. And um, and science has different tolerances for the two different types of errors. And and evidently, men and women in a in yeah. a mating scenario have different tolerances yeah, for the types right. of errors. Interesting. I'm mm -hmm. I'm curious when you think about this in terms of how you would articulate it or conceptualize a process like this. If, if you take something like error management, and that's uh, just to kind of show listeners how broadly this is applied to many things outside of um, mating and, and many aspects of life. If you're, if you're looking off the side of a cliff and another thing that's, uh, that's uh, has to do with my own life. If you're, if you're standing on top of a cliff and looking down, whereas if you're standing at the bottom of the cliff and looking up and you're asked to evaluate and estimate how, how high the cliff is, you'll have a higher number if you're standing from it looking mm -hmm. down and uh, a lower number if you're standing below it looking up. What I'm curious about is, would you call that self-deception or would that would, would you call that just like a like a motivational a, a bias skewed? Uh, yeah, just a, just a skewed bias that or perception that that has been favored. Over I think time. it's a, yeah, a motivational bias. Yes, because it it would motivate a certain kind of action. So another example that I that I really like that's along these lines is that when you're hearing a noise and you can you there are experiments that are done with speakers on wires that do demonstrate this. So when you hear a noise that is approaching you, so this piece, this noise is approaching you, speakers traveling toward you as the subject, you're blindfolded, you don't know what's going on, versus the noise is traveling away from you, you tra you estimate that it is traveling faster when it is traveling toward oh, you, that's neat. because it's better to be ready too soon than too late, mm -hmm. so in, in order to engage in evasive action, than when it's moving away from you. You don't need you, to duck away from a thing moving away from you. Yes, yeah, you can be perfectly accurate, and that's better. Now, what about something like, and I don't want to get too complicated here, uh, but, but if you, if you go back to your women being maybe skeptical of men's signs of commitment, mm -hmm. and I, I think, I, I think maybe, um, haven't guys been shown to say I love you for, uh, first more regularly in the relationship? Uh, scrap that if you don't know. I, you but, know, I mean, well, I'm not sure. Shane, in your I'm experience, sure usually do you say true. I love you first? <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> um, and I Steve feel falls it. in love easily. Uh, oh yeah, I tease time. him about that all the yeah, time. I'm like, yeah. don't fall in love, uh, don't I, fall in love. He's like, no too, late. <laughs> too late, too <laughs> late. Yeah, I'm, I'm adorable. Um, <laughs> I, but, and, and and here's the thing that I wanted to bring up is is again this question of like, would maybe this now fall under the domain of self deception? Yeah. If if say interesting. If, if mm -hmm. say you you're telling a girl that you love her like you really feel it you yeah, really believe sure. it mm -hmm. and but maybe you are primed mm -hmm. to pers uh, yeah. uh, to be more heavily influenced right. and feel those yeah. feelings more deeply yeah. to reach that like next level in the goal and yeah. then once you get there now there's a new there's a new level there's a new yeah, goal in mind that's really and, interesting. and things can mm -hmm. Can change yeah, I and, think you know. I mean, men need to be need to be pretty convincing, right? If women are skeptical, then the men do need to be convincing. And, and what, if they're convinced themselves, then they might be more. That's the idea of uh, of the evolution of self deception. Is is like it's easier to lie and deceive someone else if you believe it yourself. I see. You know what you two are describing is you're describing the song "Paradise" by the Dashboard Light by Meatloaf right now basically <laughs> <Not familiar. laughs> i'm gonna put it in the exhibits <laughs> okay good but it's a it's a story of a young couple making out by in their car mm -hmm. right the dashboard lights and and him getting to third base and wanting to go all the way and her saying will you love me forever and he eventually gives in <laughs> and then the, <laughs> and, the, and says that it says that yeah and then and then they say you know it's not, he says i'll love you to the end of time and then it breaks into the chorus which is and now we're both praying for the end of time uh, yeah um <laughs> it's a fun song <laughs> yeah, it's a yeah. long song uh, lyrics born has a fun song called i changed my mind that's that's very <laughs> much that's very idea. much about that so yeah. i i'm sure listeners are thinking about um a variety of topics right now these are all the normal things marty that i'm sure mm -hmm. you hear about well what about homosexuality what yeah. About um, mm -hmm. infidelity, and so on. Let's mm -hmm. let's wait for a moment. We'll mm -hmm. get to those. Sure. So, this is something when I was prepping for this that Shane had mentioned, and this is related, I think, to your hormones work, mm -hmm. um, which I want to I want to address. Is this notion of 
children as parasites. Oh, yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. So, so on one hand, right, we have this drive mm-hmm. and that it, that it, even though it's ancestral, it still is revealed in a variety of um, people's behaviors mm-hmm. and preferences and yeah. so on today. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, even though our societies are much more complex and that culture is pushing us in, in different directions mm-hmm. and so on. But one of the really fascinating things is just, it's sort of treated just as a, a sort of assumption at the beginning is like that children are costly, that it's yeah. hard to get them to into this world and to get them to be healthy and, to, and to thrive <laughs> and to be on their own, yeah. right? It's it's so bad today that Mm-mm. we joke that 20-somethings still can't do it. Yeah. And so... <laughs> That's what my undergraduate students would tell you. That, yeah, they're like, I ask them this question and they always squirm in their seats and they say they were definitely not self-sufficient yet. I'm turning 40 soon and jury is out on whether I'm self-sufficient not, or not. You know, like, when I was 16, I was like, oh, I could do this on my own. You know what I mean? Like, I was already... Because of my family situation, mm-hmm. like I was like, I, yeah, yeah. I've, I've got this worked out kind of a thing. Um, and so that's so, making me sad. Oh, <laughs> it's turned out OK. You know, yeah. When you know, when, when it I, built I, you into I, the I person felt, you it, are today. Yeah. 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 Well, I've got two 11 year olds. I can't imagine that in five years they're going to think that. <laughs> in six, at 16, I was like, I could move out of this house. At 16, I wanted to move out of the house. Yeah, yeah. Well, I hope um, that won't be the case either. Okay, but I also hope your your 11 year olds, when they're 26, know how to do their own laundry, right? So there's like a, a balance there. Yep. So drop it off at Wash and Fold. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I've never heard this idea of children as parasites mm-hmm. because it it conjures up these like almost a disgusting image. Yeah. But where does that come from? Well, so you, I mean, you can trace it to pregnancy. So women, this conceptus, this little, little gizmo in your, in your body that's going to grow into. Or gizmos. Yeah. In or some gizmos. Cases. Yeah. yeah. And, and if, you're, if you're a freak like me. Um, but it's so the, this little emerging organism is only half related to the mother, right? So 50% of the genes are coming from the dad and 50% of the genes are coming from the mom. Mm-hmm. So she should treat that like like a foreign body that needs to be attacked and rejected from her body. But that's not what happens because the second half of women's hormone cycles, we have a rise in progesterone, which is associated with a depressing of the immune system so that, so that we don't reject uh, this foreign right? tissue. Yeah, so, so in some sense, literally... They are parasites, or at least they're foreign bodies that are invading our own bodies as women. And and so then these hormones essentially weaken the immune system. They they allow us to tolerate the, this, this foreign body so that it can implant into the mother's tissue and start draining nutrients from her body. It's I mean, it's pros and cons. In these days, in a world filled with allergies, which are kind of a new modern thing for humanity, mm. it's uh, pregnant women are are having uh, lessened allergies, right? The, the the body's kind of going like, oh, we have an actual thing to worry about now, yeah. rather than this misperceived. I, I'm, I'm actually not sure how it how it affects mom's <laughs> you're like, you're allergies. Like dealing with hay fever, we've got the solution. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> So, it's a great pickup line. <laughs> okay, so I mean I that's hyperbolic. I don't think that's where that comes yes, from, right? right? It comes it comes from thinking about little kids and from a third party's perspective. So if it's you and your kid, you feel quite differently than if it is somebody else's kid and you're an onlooker. Mm-hmm. And they seem to be a, just a total pain in the ass. They're crying, they're fussy, they're inconsolable. When they're little tiny babies, they don't do anything rewarding. All they do is eat and poop and keep you awake at night. Mm-hmm. So an objective observer. I, that's, that's Shane in my life. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if I stay with Pete for like five days, he goes out of his mind. <laughs> Pizza hair OCD, we might say. He's I like a tidy day. house. Yes. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, well, thank goodness you don't have children. Yes. Yeah. But from an objective observer's perspective, th- this is this is incredibly disruptive, and so they do, and and they do draw down your resources in a whole lot of ways, including literally drawing down your bank account. Yes, I did. A, as an aside, I um, so on a previous episode, we looked at financial freedom and we mm-hmm. looked at some special considerations for single people. Mm-hmm. And as the bonus material, I like just took a big dump on this article 
about the financial benefits of marriage. Mm. So it's, mm. you know, the seven financial benefits of marriage. And I'm like, uh, you're ignoring that 90% yeah. of married couples have children, yeah. which wipes out all of those financial benefits. Mm. Not to mention the divorce mm. of some of those couples, which wipes out again that financial benefit. Yeah. Not having kids is my retirement plan. <laughs> <laughs> Every time I buy an upgrade on a plane, I actually subtract it from an imaginary bank account that would have paid for, for college tuition. Yeah, yeah. And it gets you away from those snot nosed kids in the, in the back of the plane. It's doubly <laughs> beneficial, yes. Now, I should say that I absolutely adore my children and I think that they're wonderful, but. Part of the reason that I absolutely adore them, in addition to the fact that they are wonderful, is that I have been I a, a variety of adaptations mm -hmm. that evolved throughout our our history, our species' long history. A variety of adaptations that are for rearing children, taking care of them, um, loving them, so that you do that have clicked in. Yes. Um, and once that happens, um, then you fall in love with your kids in the same way that that you can potentially. I mean, it's a parallel and to the ways that in which you fall in love with a mate and so you can or heavy at least drug for use a little while <laughs> <laughs> so for, at least for a little while you can ignore some of their faults you think that they're you know truly outstanding and wonderful um we may be even more biased in the, in the case of our kids because um we can fall out of love with our mates we don't tend to easily fall out of love with our kids yes that's right i have a i have a good friend he's a listener of this podcast i'm not going to name his name but he probably will know him when i talk about this so he has two kids that are around the same age. Maybe they're like 12, 14 ish. And he's like, my kids are great. Like he just loves his kids so much. Mm -hmm. And the kids are, I've met the kids and they're, they're smart and they're, they're just lovely people. You know, they're just thriving. And I'm like, how's it going with your wife? And he's like, Oh my God, I love my wife so much. Like, the, you know, like they are just, it's like, the, it's a, it's a hard, you know, that, that group of four, it's a, it's a difficult road mm -hmm. because being a family is, I think difficult to do resource wise mm -hmm. and so on, but I'm just so happy for him because yeah. he has the one two mm -hmm. where the kids, that's amazing. The kids are thriving and it hasn't come at the cost of their partnership. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think that's great. So maybe I should mention his name, but I won't. Um, so I, you don't have to answer this question if you don't want to Marty, mm -hmm. but is it weird to study this stuff yeah. and then live it, right? To study, you be like, mm -hmm. oh, my hormones are doing this to me mm -hmm. that allow me to... Yeah. Um, it, it's not weird. I mean, I think that I've gotten a number of insights because I actually am living it. It's easy. It, oh, I You see. know, and so ah, yes. um, initially, initially the the insight to, to look at how women's mating psychology changes across their hormone cycle. So is it the case... So. In non-human species, um, there's a special phase of sexuality that gets turned on during the high fertility window of the cycle that's called estrus, right? And so this is when um, primates get uh, big genital swellings that you can see on the animal planet if 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 you dare to. Um, the fragrant scent trail that um, rodents will leave behind to attract uh, male rodents to their, um, so hamsters is a classic case, attract male hamsters to their burrow. Um, and and that they'll actually even have sex in the first place. A lot of a lot of species will not have sex with outside of this fertile window. Mm -hmm. um, so, is there some parallel to that in the human species? And people thought that that was not the case because humans have sex all the time. So it's not limited to the fertile window. Um, humans will have sex, you know, before they are having fertile cycles, early in their young years, after um, cycles have ceased, during pregnancy early in the postpartum period when pregnancy is it's impossible to start a new pregnancy quite yet and so on it's and actually so, amazing we don't have more sex as it, a species. it is actually you know i say humans have sex all the time and that's a bit of a joke because we don't really have sex all the time i mean maybe we go through our phases with our partners but um but we do have sex it's not limited to the fertile period yes. and so people thought as a result of that 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 humans were different from all other species and you know this the, the hormones we have they control other things but they don't have anything to do with our sexuality <laughs> so basically humans are like we're special we're special <laughs> <Yeah>. humans <laughs> we're special and you can find, you so here's the phrase that gets used in scientific papers humans had been emancipated from hormonal control <laughs> <laughs> and I thought that sounded like bullshit. Yes. I, that just did not make any sense to me. And and the reason, of course, is because um, 
still those are the only days in which a woman can become pregnant. And so is her mating, is her thinking about mating going to be exactly the same across all those phases of the, of the cycle? Is it going to be the same when she can become pregnant versus when she cannot? Sure. I didn't think that seemed very plausible. And I also By knew, the way, is it men writing writing that phrase more often than women? Um, Some, some of the key papers that I can think of, <laughs> yes, were written by men. But, but that was also back in a time when there were, weren't That's as fair. many women That's fair. That's there fair. to do the research. Well, it's also just classic egocentric. I mean, we, we like humans, like we we find out that we're primates, you know, just like other primates, but still made the differentiation. Like, well, we're not monkeys, we're apes. Not just any apes, we're great apes. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah so I think <laughs> we that, gave ourselves that name. Yes. <laughs> I think that that was, that was part of it. But, um, and, you know, speaking to the, the issue of, you know, whether this was males or females who were thinking that we didn't have this hormonal component. One of the things that, that drove me to do this work was observing in myself and observing by talking to my female friends that we didn't feel the same way. And we didn't think that it was because we were fickle or irrational. We thought that perhaps that there was something patterned there that was interesting. I see. That makes good sense. And so, I mean, I think this happens a lot in the sciences, at least in the behavioral sciences, where you get an insight either from a puzzle you see in the world. Mm -hmm. Why are people doing that? Right. Or you just notice something that's quirky about about yourself. Mm -hmm. And, um, and you go, ah, I don't know exactly why that's happening. And I'm supposed to know why that's happening. Maybe the way I've been thinking about it might be wrong. Okay. So I want to ask the two of you to do something slightly different. Maybe. We'll okay. Say. Um, so as you know, this is a, a podcast for single people. And so I want to ask for a specific perspective from the two of you. All right. So because coupling up or as you call it, pair bonding, mm -hmm. Um, and, and, you know, marriage and children are so common. It seems like a lot of the work is focused on those behaviors. Like, why does that happen? Mm -hmm. And so on. Um, and yet there are non trivial deviations from that. Okay. That set mm -hmm. of behavior. So I already alluded to one, you know, this, this notion of homosexuality, yeah. um, promiscuity, mm -hmm. infidelity. Um, and then if we just take a view and we look at the rising number of single people, mm -hmm. so we'll, we'll look at the United States, 28% of households in the United States are one person mm -hmm. or solo. The projections like Pew Center has one out of four millennials will never marry. Yeah. Right. These are really mm -hmm. fascinating, mm -hmm. um, uh, statistics, which I think suggest that we're on to something with this podcast mm -hmm. as mm -hmm. a, as a, as a place to have these conversations. I guess my question is, are there varied evolutionary strategies within a species that can explain this? How much of this is just the conflict between culture and our ancestral past, our abilities to sort of override some of our natural mm -hmm. preferences and desires? Um, I, I'm asking, I'm asking because I think that like, yeah. I'm interested not in the majority case. I'm interested in the minority cases. Mm -hmm. And so what comes to mind as I bring this up? Well, there's, there's things we were just talking the other day about how, just how evolution kind of optimizes everything. And there's, there's things like, uh, like, okay, so sex feels good so that you'll have more sex so that you'll have more kids, right? Okay. That makes sense as a drive. Why not? make sex feel even better most people are like well how much better could it feel i could tell you a lot better like mm -hmm. you know there's good nights bad nights there's uh, people have sex on drugs sometimes that heighten the experience or take doctor prescribed viagra or what have you you know there there's i've even heard like there's a, some asymmetry between self-stimulated sex and partner sex in terms of self-reported pleasure and so on hmm I yeah. read the paper though, but but that's the idea. Is like why in the world? And I mean, my understanding is we don't know exactly the answer to that. But there must have there must have been some costs right. if everyone's yeah. just having crazy sex all the time. It, you know, there's so many other things that we need to do in life in terms of survival and uh, and raising the kids that we are producing and diseases that can be caught from being overly promiscuous and and so. Um, and uh, uh, couple that with, so, 
so evolution carving out kind of this um perception of like recognizing that these things are really costly children are really costly there's aspects of pair bonding that can be costly and then you couple with that with something that evolution never saw coming which is reliable birth control yeah and maybe it was the case through our evolutionary history that all sorts of people like dreamed of living the single life and having all sorts of adventures and and uh, and and uh, but they what had is no it li- choice in the living matter. a remarkable life or whatever but you're still gonna have sex once in a while and then you're gonna have now you got this responsibility mm-hmm. and everything else yeah and um for people in traditional societies non-industrial societies then you know the kids are part of they're part of what makes the family work they're part of what feeds everybody um, so you actually need kids in order to sustain yourself. Um, you know, you need them to help with the livestock or help with the hunting and the gathering. And so kids, you know, they didn't, they didn't just hang out and watch video games <laughs> <laughs> or play video games rather. Um, they, they were actually, they actually served a, a function in terms of their labor. And they still, yeah, as you say, they still do in some societies. They're, absolutely. That's right. I yeah. was talking with, um, with, uh, Sophia Rockland who, who had been touring with me on my head talks show. She, she's in Peru right now. She studies these, uh, Shipibo people down there. And I was just kind of curious. We're driving one day and some, you know, correctional van or whatever drove by. And I was just thinking about it and I was like, what's like the discipline and in, in policing and stuff like in those cultures down there? And she's like, kids don't have like time out or anything. They're like, they're not, they're not treated. They're not served like different foods. There's not baby food and stuff. They're just like a part of the community. And then they're very early on brought out on hunts and things like that and shown how Treated to like, like basket adults. weave and, yeah. and everything else. And so, so it's like instilled in them the big cost of like going and, you know, things that kids these days don't really like, you know, vandalism or something like that. You can't really appreciate the true cost because you don't own a house yourself. It's another 10 years before you're going to have to be responsible for that and really comprehend what that means when someone come, some jerk comes by and eggs your house or whatever, you know, and, and where there's just not that same kind of behavior. Not that there isn't, there's, there's still, they still have like kind of laws and things like that, but, but it seems, uh, different. Not, there's no juvie. And, 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 and that's also not that the groups, the pre-industrial groups that still exist today, they also might be very, very different than the ancestors yeah, that we sure. came from. Mm-hmm. And, and the reason why they're still pre-industrial is because of whatever constraints that they had in terms of like being able to make things agricultural in the first place might have influenced their lives and behavior more than so it's not necessarily the clearest picture of like it's not necessarily a time machine to to look at some hunter gatherer group and make a mm-hmm. inference like well this is must be what our ancestors looked like but we do know that that we are enabled to have um a lot more freedom from worry about where our next meal is going to come from Indeed. whereas people live much closer to the margin in those in these mm-hmm. so- traditional societies today and we presume was the case of, throughout our evolutionary history hello listener that was a natural break point in our conversation check out the next episode for the remainder of this fun fascinating conversation Thanks again for listening. Cheers. Thank you for listening to Solo, the single person's guide to a remarkable life. For more about our guests and show notes, go to petermcgraw.com. Please subscribe and share with your single friends. 